I love the cinema. I love going to films. My kind of favorite type of films is those end of the world disaster films. Kind of a bit of light reading and watching in this kind of crazy day we're in. One of my favorite kind of films in this era is Jurassic Park. Now, I'm talking about the original here, not those weird stuff we watch at the moment. But in the original, for those who haven't watched it, uh, the scientists recreate dinosaurs. It doesn't quite go according to plan. Uh, there's a lot of running and jumping and screaming, a lot of chomping, but it's a great film. And in this film, Jeff Goldblum says an immortal line. Your scientists were so preoccupied with whether they could, they forgot to think if they should. Now, in this film, he was referring to the fact that could scientists recreate dinosaurs? Well, yes, they could. Should they? Well, the fact that most of them got eaten, probably not a great thing. But for me, the interesting question is more about if those scientists knew then what they know now, or before they got eaten, would they have recreated dinosaurs? Probably not. Now, you may think this is a crazy idea, and it's science fiction, and yeah, the no, real world is not like that. Yeah, not, not quite. Today's modern society, for the last 200 years, we pushed, and we've created, and we've innovated. But a lot of the times, it's at the detriment to this should side of things, the ethics side of things. So I want to see if what, where we are at the moment, what are we today in this should, could balance? But before I go into the where we are today, I want to give you a background, a bit of history, and to give you a bit of perspective. So I want to give two examples. First example is CFCs. Now, just a little uh, test. Can you please put your hands together if you've heard of CFCs before? OK. So a mix. So we've got a little clap over there. That's good. But, uh, so we've got a couple of scientists in the and there's a good reason that a lot of you haven't heard it. Now, CFCs were created in the early 20th century. They were uh, mass used in the 60s and 70s. And they were non-toxic for humans. They were fire resistant. And they were very popular products in things like canisters, hairsprays, uh, deodorants, even refrigerators. In the 80s, that's why you get all the big hair. It's great hairspray. The trouble was, though, is that between, say, the 60s and 70s and up to the 80s, they started doing a lot of research because they found that skin cancer was drastically on the increase. And they kind of did a bit of like research, and they found out that the, especially in places like Australia, that the ozone layer was being eaten up. Now that's not a technical term, but yeah, we'll go with it. It's been eaten up, and they believe it was because, well, they, they understood it was because of CFCs. So by the early 90s, they ended up banning CFCs. That's why a lot of you probably haven't heard of it, because it just doesn't, they're not creating it anymore. Now let me give you an example that's a bit more up to date. Uh, let's take plastics. Now I'm not going to ask you if you know plastics, because if you haven't heard it, your head has been in the sand, or at least a plastic field sand, uh, for the last 20 years. So plastics, like CFCs, were created in the late 19th, early 20th century. Like CFCs, they were mass produced and mass used in the 60s and 70s. But unlike CFCs, plastics were uh, used to a, a greater extent, but they weren't to the detriment of humanity, of humans. Yes, they were a detriment to, uh, uh, to wildlife and to seas and coastlines, but at the moment, there is no hard evidence to say that they are killing us. Now, there is research going on that is looking into plastics in the food chain. And so, so the fish eat the plastics, we eat the fish, so there's got to be something wrong. And I strongly believe that once they find out, or if they find out, that plastics are actually harming us as humans, there'll be a push not only to ban that, but to 
uh, sorry, they're not just to uh, reduce it or uh, to recycle, but to ban. So let's ask the question of the, what Jurassic Park asked. Could they create CFCs and plastics? Yes, they could. Should they? Well, if those scientists knew then what we know now, would they have created CFCs and plastics? Not sure. So let's take it up to the modern day. As a host said, uh, I'm a, a father. Uh, interesting fact, there are two things uh, about a, a new form father. First of all, it's amazing how much a human can do with the complete lack of sleep. Second of all, it's amazing how much a human being drools. And I'm not talking about my wife, this is my child. But when I'm thinking about not just today, but into the future, I want to see, well, what is this balance going to be like? Now, I'd love to be able to go back in time with my DeLorean or whatever time machine you love to use and go and talk to those scientists. But I can't. If I could, I wouldn't be here and I'd be a very rich man if I could. But what I can do is I can talk to the scientists today and we can look at the potential future and we can have a balanced argument. So looking at that, I want to look at self-driving cars or fully autonomous vehicles as because that's kind of the, the in thing these days. So smart cars started around the 90s. Now, I'm not talking about Knight Rider or Kit here, because my argument would just be completely out the window if we do that. But over the last, say, two decades, cars have got significantly smarter. Sensors, technology inside the cars, have allowed us to have better journeys, easier journeys, safer journeys. But I want to talk about the could and the should. So could we create self-driving cars? Well, yes, we can. The evidence shows that within 15 to 20 years, we'll be mass-producing self-driving cars. Should we? Well, to answer that question, I want to look at two things. First, safety. Second one, norms. So let's look at safety. So in terms of numbers, there is around about a billion cars on the road, there's a million death rate, give or take. So your death rate is about 0.1%. If I take self-driving cars, at the moment there is 35 cities testing, testing self-driving cars. Now we don't know the exact numbers, because security, but we believe there's about 1,000 of them. The death rate for self-driving cars is about 0.3 to 0.4%, because there's four confirmed deaths, that at least we know of, that are directly attributed to self-driving cars. Now, a lot of you may think, OK, four deaths, that's bad, I know, shame, but progress, importance, let's move on, let's get self-driving cars out there, because up to 90% of those million that died is due to human error. If you can take the human out of the error, then that's got to be a good thing. OK, that's an interesting argument, but it's OK, it's still, a, it's still a sound argument. And that's why I want to come to norms. Now, norms is what you're normally used to. So for example, for me, when I was leaving university, my norm was to physically go and buy uh, music, so cassette tapes, LPs, CDs. For the, the kids, or sorry, the young adults that are coming out of university today, their norm is to stream music, is to just assume that they can have any music they want whenever they want it. So the art of the mixtape against is just is completely gone. For those of you who don't know what a mixtape is, then, then you're missing out completely, I'll tell you. So that's, that's a good example. So let's take the, the two things that the private car is being used to at the moment. First one is driving to work. Second one is driving to the shops. So when I was leaving university, driving to the shops was a physical thing you did. You, went, you physically drove to the shops. Today, as you're leaving university, 
your first or your norm, your first point of call is online. Amazon, eBay, Bowl.com, you name it, the first port of call is online. Doesn't mean you don't go to the shops, but your first thought is online. Work. When I was leaving university, my first thought was driving to work. And where do I work? London, Amsterdam, Paris, Chicago. Nowadays, the conversation is slightly altered. It's what do I want to do? How do I want to do it? Not where do I want to do it? If you look at virtual, uh, virtual technology, e-learning, everything from holograms to v, uh, AR and VR, all drastically changing how we think about the office today. So let's take my child, that by the time she's between 15 and 20, depending on what education is like in the future, um, she'll be leaving university, hopefully with her own credit card, if we have money or credit cards in the future. I don't know. But if we take that extreme, now, music, no idea. I'm hoping there will still be music, but I don't know what form it is. But the trend for at least shopping and office is kind of fair to see. So the trend for shopping, in 15 years' time, there just will not be shops. High streets are already dying, as we know. There just won't be the need, with the technology of websites and online, there just won't be the need to go to the shops. Offices, within 15 to 20 years' time, there just won't be the need for offices. Technology, like we said, AR, VR, holograms. If you take, say, something like Moore's Law, and you push it 15 years from now to the future, the technology will be stunningly different to what we're used to today. So at the moment, my daughter is leaving university. She won't be driving to work. She won't be driving to the shops. So not only will she not need a self-driving car, she probably won't even need a car in the first place. So let's look at the could versus the should. Could they create self-driving cars? Yes, they can. Should they? Well, if the sciences today can listen to the potential future of my daughter, then hopefully the should will outweigh the could. Thank you.